Welcome back to Law Talk Moments, a legal program designed to help make the complex simple and to promote the practice of law, which I unapologetically consider to be a noble profession. My name is attorney Rob Caprera, and I'm humbled to be your host again for this program. In our last program, we set the table for this series on how to deal with people suffering from compromised thinking, dementia, and specifically Alzheimer's disease. This is an issue dear to my heart because I have had to navigate the emotional roller coaster of these situations with many families and many clients in my 40 years of practice. And additionally, my grandmother and mother lingered in dementia before dying 11 years and eight years respectively. So I know the landscape. And I wanna reach out in this series to offer some help to those of you who are impacted in your lives by this end of life challenge. From a legal point of view, we must approach this mental problem from a fundamental consideration of what is called competency. Before a lawyer can help a person with compromised mental ability, it must be determined that that person is competent. That is to say, does the person have sufficient mental capacity to enter into a particular transaction or execute a particular document or simply to think or speak or act in a rational way. An analysis at this juncture could take us deep into the weeds on this legal topic, and that is not my intent of this program. I wanna make this complex topic as simple as I can, so let me try to squeeze out of this vast subject some basic nuggets. Massachusetts Law, Chapter 190B, Section 2-501, states simply, that a person may make a will who is an individual 18 or more years of age who is of sound mind. So what is it to be of sound mind, at least insofar as estate planning matters are concerned? The person must know who he or she is. The person must have a reasonable awareness of what he or she owns. The person must be aware of who are his or her heirs and family members and people who might have a reasonable expectation of inheritance. The person must understand, to a clear enough extent, the nature and significance of the document they are about to sign. And finally, the person should be acting knowingly and willingly without being under coercion or duress and not affected by fraud or deception. This soundness of mind is often referred to as testamentary capacity. And interestingly, in probate practice, a presumption exists that every person has a testamentary capacity until proven otherwise. As an attorney, it has often been comforting to proceed on the behalf of a client or family in a situation where the person is questioned, maybe borderline competent. Like many other attorneys or notaries, I've had to make a subjective call many times that a person is competent. To make this call even easier is the nuance in the law that says, a person doesn't have to be continually competent throughout the 24 hours of the day to have sufficient testamentary capacity, but that only at the time of signing the document, the person must be competent. In other words, as the case law has highlighted this situation over and over again, if the person has had a transient surge of lucidity or a lucid interval, at the time of signing, then the person is competent enough to undertake a legal and binding act. Suffice it to say, in potentially close situations, I will always suggest to families that I obtain signatures in the morning hours after a nice breakfast than to try to get signatures in the late afternoon or early evening when sundowning is likely to occur. As you can see, competency is an important concern in estate planning, but it is hardly a black and white determination. All people are different, and they act differently due to their age, their health, their emotions, their situations, and a nearly endless list of causative factors. Based upon my experience, I will admit that on some occasions the determination of competency has been tricky, but by and large, if a person is incompetent and does not have testamentary capacity, it is grossly obvious. Aside from a quick onset of mental inability caused by stroke, family and friends usually have fair warning that a friend or loved one is starting to slip mentally. It is at this time, with the prompting of this hint, that a lawyer should be called in to address estate planning matters. I can't tell you how many times families have called me and asked me to get involved when it was too late. 
when their loved one was way past the point of competency. It is doubly sad for me at these times that the family is having to deal with this issue and that they will now have to deal with extra problems and extra costs that could have easily been avoided with better planning. The point is this. There is a lot an attorney can do to help a family with a loved one who is slipping into dementia. With a heart to help you in this situation, in our next program I will begin discussing some of these legal options starting with a review of the durable power of attorney. Thanks for joining us today. As always, if you have any questions regarding what we've discussed, please contact me through my website, www.capreralaw.com. And I'll be very glad to discuss your situation and lend whatever help I can. It truly is a privilege and a pleasure for me to be able to speak to you about these matters. Our laws are for our benefit, not our detriment. But if the laws are not understood, they really can't help us at all. So let me continue to try to make the complex simple for you. As always, thank you for listening and take care.